Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, or whatever time it is you're watching this. It is Wednesday, March 15th, 2017, and this is the promotional malpractice live chat here on MMAfighting.com. My name is Luke Thomas. Thank you so much for joining me. I am the host of this podcast, as you are probably familiar with. Um, we'll go for about 90 minutes today, a little bit less. Taking your questions, comments, bitches, gripes, and smart-ass remarks, you can do so. There's a live thread in the description box of this video, or you're probably watching it on MMAfighting.com. The questions that turn green get priority, but not exclusivity. Um, like I said, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, main topics to get to today, obviously going to be Kelvin Gastelum versus Anderson Silva is a big one. Um UFC London is this weekend. World Series of Fighting 35 is this weekend. I can't imagine that's at the top of your list of priorities, but it is certainly available to discuss, as well as whatever else is sort of on your mind and at least remotely relevant in some kind of way. Um, so that's it. Oh, if you bought a T-shirt, and of course we'll get some more sold here fairly soon, but if you bought one uh, and you don't mind, send me a picture of it. Like You can still be in the wrapper or on you or, or whatever. Just send me a picture. I'm trying to put them all together. A bunch of you already have, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, without further ado, let's get going. Trim my beard up a little bit. Still got a little ways to go, but it's good for our first draft, right? All right. With that out of the way, let's see these questions. <laughs> well, first one's not relevant. Uh, did, it's got six wrecks. Did Rachel Maddow basically show how fake news is made last night? Did Rachel Maddow basically show how fake news is made last night? No. There's this thing going around where everyone's like, it's something I don't like. There is, you know, uh, the presentation of it is not 100% accurate. Therefore, it is fake. Or here is something I don't understand. Therefore, it is fake. There's this label of like fake news being thrown around, which is just sort of this catch-all for things I don't understand or don't like or are presented somewhat poorly. Uh, I would say what she did last night was not fake news. I would say what she did last night was clickbait, the TV version of it, because she gets on Twitter earlier in that evening and she says, oh my God, I have Trump's tax returns. Well, sort of. You have it for, uh, you have two pages of the 1040, which doesn't tell you much from 2005. And what you do have mostly exonerates him. This is not this is not, I mean, which is which is needs to be reported, but that's sort of not what she had intimated. And she spent like the first twenty minutes, you know, being like, "Here is this destructive thing that's happening with the lack of tax returns," and then the evidence she presented doesn't uphold that. So, so no, I would say it's more clickbait. It's more like we've got Trump's tax returns, and you won't believe what happens next. And then you click on, it, you're like, "This is not. This is not. This is nothing." It's more, it's more that, uh, less than, you know, it being sort of fake or phony. I ran into this actually related to MMA over the weekend. Well, half MMA, half something else. Um, you guys all know Preet Bharara was dismissed. Jesus Christ, is there a... Anyway, and um, uh, a U.S. attorney, and uh, which is fine, They're, they get... They get they're asked to resign all the time, and, and there's a good cause for that, right? Because they're essentially political appointees, not ultimately, at the end of the day, civil servants. So when there's a new president, you're supposed to resign. And he didn't, and he was fired. And the reason why he's relevant is because that's the guy that took down Sheldon Silver. Sheldon Silver, you might recall, was the Speaker Assembly in New York who refused to let a vote for MMA ever get to the floor, and so they could never really have an up or down vote on it. And, of course, it turns out he was magnificently corrupt and uh and so there you go so why preet barara refused to resign and then was fired i don't know but the washington post put an article up and i posted it on my facebook page and someone's like so this is more evidence of fake news it's like no this is entirely accurate he was asked to resign which is totally within the right of the administration and the next one the next one the next one it's well within the right to do that uh quite common and there's a purpose behind it and uh he didn't want to and so they fired him, which is also within their right. Now, you can be happy about that. You can be sad about that. But that's what happened. And uh, and someone was like, this is more fake news. <laughs> Clinton's Janarino fired 93 attorneys. Yeah, I understand that. But, like, if you – but they're just saying what actually happened and actually give context for that in that particular article. So, so long story short, you're seeing a lot of this, like, I don't like this particular piece of news for a variety of different reasons. Some maybe justified, some not. So therefore, I'm going to call it fake. Mm, I'd be very careful about that. 
Jesus. Then there's this debate about what else we want to hear. Uh, UFC London. Oh, you know what? Let me get to the one that turned green first. Uh, what did you think about the recent performances of Mackenzie Dern and Angela Lee? If they were in the UFC right now, where would you rank them? Fairly low uh, is where I would rank them. I mean, Mackenzie Dern might be able to get by because she has such a tremendous ground game. And Lee's ground game is really, really good too. But um, you don't want them in the UFC right now, which is to say, I think eventually they'll find their way to some sort of very high level. Angela Lee, who knows if one will be able to hold on to her, but was she 20 years old, something like that? And Dern, 23, 24? But uh, or maybe twenty five even, but um, they're still in a portion of their game where it would be super detrimental to put them in the UFC. So, like, could they compete? Maybe, maybe they could. Uh, maybe they could scratch some, a couple of wins and cobble them together. But that seems to me like a real bad idea. This is the same reason why it's like I know everyone likes CM Punk, and everyone who has some kind of association with him the McMahon family notwithstanding, seems to have really positive things to say for the most part, which to me is not surprising. But forcing him to this level this quickly is real bad for his development. Like if he wants to get better as a fighter, it's real bad. So let's go through Angela Lee, right? Like what is she good at? Obviously she's great on the ground. She has good control of mount. Doesn't have the heaviest ground to pound, but she can pass to certain positions. She can hold position. She's just she's just really hard to get off of you. Um, and she likes to take dominant positions generally. Like some grapplers, they don't mind sort of you know either moving around a lot or not sticking to a strategy. Like think about Maya. What does he want to do? He wants to take you down and probably get to your back, but we'll settle for mount. Right, he doesn't really. It's sort of direct. He doesn't really fool around with a lot of different positions because he has dexterity there. So she's kind of like that in a way. On the ground, she uh, standing. Excuse me. She likes to put a lot, ton of pressure forward. She puts heavy combinations together, but not a lot of defensive head movement at all. Um, good about putting opposition at the end of her punches. Like sort of really natural about range finding. But um, somebody who um, who has good wrestling and good footwork and you know uh decent accurate punching at this stage at this stage is going to give her a lot of problems so you want to let her mature add those things in get better about it we talked about it before i think in mma your offense tends to come first and then defense gets woven in a little bit later um and so you're seeing a lot of that offensively there's a lot to like from angela lee defensively i think there's some work that needs to be done mackenzie dern Something relatively similar. I would say that her takedowns are good away from the cage. On the cage, they're slow, if non-existent. She really has to work on not really the speed with which she gets somebody down, but when she gets someone against the fence, she's getting stalemated here pretty quickly. Um, so some things to work on there. Uh, her entries into takedowns have gotten a lot better. Um, and again, a work in progress. But, you know, she throws these wide elbow out punches and she throws them with a lot of ferocity because she's really trying to get people to cover up. But you can imagine a really good striker backing up, firing an uppercut, and just absolutely drilling her. We've yet to see her really hurt to see how she responds to punishment. Angela Lee less so in that regard. Um, so, so you know, on the ground, obviously, she's tremendous. She can move right to mount. She can hold it. You know, she's got a lot of different uh, answers for when people move to certain positions. Mackenzie Dern does. But against the fence, she needs work. Entering takedown, she's getting a lot better, but those still need work. Um, um, and she has some defensive head movement, I think. Um, but the way in which she likes to compete is the wall as a, as it currently stands is a big component of her game and it on balance is a help to her. But if we're going to significantly jump levels, that inability to get quick takedowns from the cage, I think is going to be very much to her detriment. So pump the brakes a little bit. They're elite prospects. They're getting better. They've got a lot of great offense, but the defense needs to come behind it a little bit or the sharpening of that offense, which essentially is a form of defense in a way. Um, and when that happens, then let's move them on up. So they, you know, they're talented. They can get wins. Not really the point, you know. A uh, good question here about UFC London. Do you think people are being too harsh on the London card this weekend? Well, you know, your mileage may vary. I don't think it's a particularly good card, but there are some decent gems on it. Sure. Obviously, it's very Europe-centric and short on star power, but for a European Fight Pass event, I think it's pretty solid. I think Manoa, Anderson, being bumped up to the main event late put a bad taste in people's mouths. 
also having it compared to even if it's unfair you know the bellator main event between daily and uh, mcdonald you know that didn't sit well either and it's not a fight that gets people going but there's a lot of fights and fighters that i'm interested in seeing here uh gunny joban is a great fight and duffy is always fun to watch alan amir Khani is another really good fight uh, between two big prospects and you also have pickett's last fight against vera on the prelims you also have prospects like vicente luque tom breeze i can't pronounce this guy's name tom diakisi as well as who I'm interested in seeing progress. I think this could be one of those cards that people sleep on but ends up providing lots of action. Well, everyone always says that whenever there's a card that people bag on, right? So there's always a card that people bag on, and then there's always an inevitable response from the fan base, a different portion of it, I suppose, that say, oh, no, this card's going to be amazing. So that that, that that sort of tug of war always happens. Um, and there's people, you know, the other way around, people who think a fight's going to, card's going to be great, and it ends up, uh, you know, being not great, and everyone else sort of piles on them for saying as much. So... This is an inevitable conflict that happens in the fan base. In terms of just sort of looking at this card, let's let's just look at that now. Um, I agree with you that there are a lot of redemptive features to it, main event not being one of them, which is not a bad fight, just not really a serving main event. My dogs are barking. So in the main, main card, you have Manuel versus Anderson, which is a fine fight, just doesn't really hold much weight as a main event. Gunnar Nelson versus Alan Joban, which I think is fantastic. I think Gunnar's going to run over him. Um, you know, MMA's crazy, though. Brad Pickett, in his, as you mentioned, in his last fight against Marlon Vera. Arnold Allen taking on Amir, um, excuse me, Makwan Amir Khani. I'm less sold on the uh, value of that one, although I am high on Amir, Amir Khani. Then you have Joseph Duffy in his last fight on his UFC contract, so that's interesting. Um, you know, Daniel Omelanchuk versus Timothy Johnson doesn't do a whole lot for me. The Tom Brees fight, I agree, is good. Leon Edwards versus Vicente Luque is good. Ian Entwistle versus Brett Johns is probably going to be short. And then, you know, Lena Landsberg finally getting a shot at, uh, and of course, Tom Brees and Lena Landsberg getting a shot at Bantamweight. Yeah, there, there are some fine fights on this. You know, it's just, there's a lot of, it's not clear exactly what some of the higher end value is here. But as you mentioned, look, it's in the middle of the afternoon. It's on Fight Pass, if you're an American anyway. Um, what do you got to lose? This is fine. You know, it's not, they're not asking a whole lot of you, so. So then you shouldn't be able to complain too much. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, to me, the big bout on that card is going to be um, uh, Gunner versus uh, Alan Joban. I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, Eddie Alvarez versus Dustin Poirier. What do you make of this matchup? Love it. And Alvarez's choice to pick Poirier over Chiesa. Doesn't this seem like a more difficult matchup? It does, and it is probably, although that's probably a point of debate as well. Uh, I think Alvarez has finally, to some extent, put the, you know, not that I think he should feel shame, but I suspect he does feel some shame about the loss to Conor McGregor. I think he has largely, or at least, you know, enough put that behind him, and he's really looking to get back on the horse. Now, you lose to Conor McGregor in the way that he did, as long as he remains champion, it's going to be a very long time, if ever, before you get another title shot at him. But as you know, holding titles in this uh, organization, to the extent you defend them regularly, can be a very, very difficult task. So um, so I think you probably picked the Poirier one because it's a guaranteed action fight. Uh, Poirier obviously is very good on the ground, but isn't so doggedly aggressive about maintaining strong position. Um, much more likely to bang it out on the feet where I think Alvarez believes he holds an advantage. Whether that's true or not, I think um, Poirier is a little bit longer in the tooth. Uh, I think he does take a good shot, but he's a little too willing to take a shot. So it's a better action fight, and it's probably a fight that's that has more name value for him and has a fight that uh, he believes he probably can more closely win. Like the, the guess of fight, like... Someone pitched to you, oh, Eddie Alvarez is going to fight Michael Chiesa. I'm like, this is great. This is an amazing fight. Like, who could be against such a thing? But if Alvarez is sort of thinking about what's best for him while still maintaining a degree of difficulty, um, I, I suspect that's why he picked or, you know, f fancies the Poirier fight more, you know. Uh, just so it's interesting is um, it's amazing, right? Like, I don't think we want to live in a world where fighters 
pick all of their own bouts. I mean, such a thing is impossible, right? Because it sort of mutually requires a crossover. But um, I don't think we want that world. But it is interesting that the UFC has partly not ceded control to them, but certainly ceded input to them. You know, and they can't make them fight anyone, right? They're independent contractors. But um, it's that that tug of war is something I'm really paying attention to because I don't think fans want a world. Everyone's like, you know, how do I explain this exactly? Um, we're sort of in this space now where someone's like, why would, why, why should X fight Y when he could fight Z and make more money and it's an easier fight? And it's like, right, I get that if you're X. What I don't get is if you're a fan. Because it makes absolute rational sense for a person to want to take more money for less risk, provided that's the scenario. But what I think fans want to be very careful about is saying, I understand why X would want that, and therefore I'm okay with that. Two different things. I have a totally different sense of what kind of fights I want than what a, a fighter might want either for themselves or someone else. And everyone's input as a consumer, as media, as a matchmaker, as a fighter themselves, it all goes into a pot and it's sort of a mix and, and different sensibilities went out for different reasons at different times. But the point being is, you know, we often see the UFC make a decision about something and fans will say, well, it makes sense for the UFC. That's great. That's got nothing to do with what I want or what you may want or he may want or she may want. Um, I have an entirely different sense about what I think is okay. And I think what's best for the sport, just sort of looking around is fighters definitely having input. But as much as I'm in favor of, and I'm very much in favor of collective bargaining, particularly as it relates to fighter pay, I think we should be very careful about to what extent we enable fighters and I'm not saying this scenario gets even close to that, but I think this is the beginning roots of what could eventually become something else. Seeding control of fighters in terms of matchmaking and then giving allowance to them when, when they say, well, you know, this would be better for me. I can make more money. It's an easier fight. Therefore, I want it. Great. I completely understand that. I hold no grudge against any fighter who ever says something like that. But I think it's better if we, you know, we don't, I mean, force is a strong word. But we ultimately have a mechanism in play to make one fight two, two fight three, three fight four, and four fight five. That, to me, preserving that ability to maintain those kinds of fights, whether or not it's ultimately the number one choice for fighter X or fighter Y, I think is very important. And I think we really need to pay attention to that as, as time goes on. Certainly, that's the position we're mostly in now, which is why we still see a lot of it. But as the sport changes and its governance changes and the power structure changes and who knows, Maybe these, maybe these, these associations fizzle and die, and this in legislation introduced by Representative Mark Wayne Mullen goes the way of the dodo bird. Okay, then this conversation will, won't be relevant anymore. But you guys sort of have the same sense that I do that there's some kind of change I think is going to happen sooner or later, and I think preserving a measure of control in matchmaking to the promoter. Uh, is in your interest. And I know that's a little hard to accept sometimes, particularly if you're a fighter, you don't want to hear that. And I can understand that. I think we should make it up to them in other ways, particularly with a significant pay bump or, you know, to the extent we can make one financially doable. But I'm very, very wary of this. I've seen it a lot. Well, why wouldn't he take, why would he take that fight? This one's easier and he makes more. Okay, I get that if you're him. I don't get high five in that person for that. You, you should want to see the fights that make you the happiest, that you think are the best for the sport, that you think are the best for the division, that you think should most happen, whether or not that coheres with what any individual fighter wants. GSP versus Silva. What are the chances this dream match finally happens at 185 with Silva challenging GSP for the title? I guess if Silva goes in there and just murks Kelvin Gastelum, which I find, like you, probably unlikely. Uh, very unlikely, super unlikely. GSP just doesn't seem interested in this one. Now, I guess if Silva goes in there and just destroys Kelvin Gastelum and reasserts himself in the division in some kind of way, and GSP beats Michael Bisping, which I also find to be unlikely, but stranger things have happened, of course, um, then there might be some momentum behind it. But even if both those guys win, uh, GSP, 
you know, there's still Romero hanging out there. What if Jacare just rolls over Robert Whitaker? It just feels like GSP never really wanted it when he was active. And yes, he's moving up to middleweight. And yes, he's fighting for a title. But I don't, he just doesn't seem to ever think he wants this one. So t- to me, to get that to change at this point was A, GSP would have to be champion. And B, Anderson would have to substantially improve his brand. Now, his name is huge. And everyone knows him, and everyone has respect for what he's done in his career. That goes without saying. But a lot of people are passed. Like Michael Bispin kind of passed on it as an idea. St. Pierre kind of passed on it as an idea. Because I think they're like, eh, he's sort of barely beating Derek Brunson. Whether or not that's a you know fair thing to say. Uh, and so they're just not that interested. So he would have to like really reanimate the energy behind him for that to change. And, you know, Can you do that against Kelvin Gastelum? Pro- probably so, but... That's a that's a tall order in and of itself. Someone says stylistically, I think Kiesa would be a harder fight for Alvarez. Yeah, I would probably agree with that. There's a picture of um, Logan. What's this guy's name? Hugh Jackman. That's his name. Luke, let's assume for a moment that you decide to become a professional MMA fighter. I definitely wouldn't. What weight division would you choose? I'd probably try to get to middleweight, maybe light heavy, something like that. What kind of adjustments would you make to the weight and compete at it? I don't know what that means. By adjustments, I mean the diet and weightlifting. Oh, I don't know. Hire a coach or something. Would you reduce the weight training? Yes, of course you'd have to. By the way, is the new Wolverine appearance based on you? LOL. <laughs> uh, Logan is a poor man's, just the way he looks in this movie, is a poor man's Wolverine. And I'm a ultra poor man's Logan. So, sort of. By the way, I think it's going to be out on Sunday. Speaking of all this weight training stuff, I went back and found a bunch of videos, like Cain Velasquez's little videos, where he's leg, I mean, he was leg extending. Leg extends where you sit down, and then you just sort of kick your feet out in front of you, and you have the weights sort of on your shins on a machine. Leg extending, 300 plus pounds for like 50 reps, which is like, I mean, the most insane thing ever. Anyway, I've, I told you guys I got this technique. He talked coming out with this guy named Phil Daru. I, you know, if you're not really into exercise science, I don't know how much this will be interesting to you, unfortunately. But um, I am telling you, there is something to be said for understanding how bad current training is, how barbaric it is, how out of out of touch it is, and how much better it could be, and what the intersection is between proper training, nutrition, less of nutrition, but there's been a growth in training to reduce injuries. There is reason to believe that adjusting training to avoid injuries has also improved training generally. In other words, it's not training's not just better because it causes less injury. In trying to find a way to mitigate the kinds of training that causes injury, they're producing better training for general purpose needs. And I talked to a guy who's an expert in this um, in my next technique talk, and I'm very excited about it. Um, I know some people who don't lift weights or run or anything like that. They don't care about it, and I understand that. But I'm telling you that we are on the cusp of figuring out how to best train for this and all the advantages it confers, not merely a reduction in injury, but an improvement in outcomes um, from a more global perspective. And and we talk a lot about fighters ego lifting we put videos in there and how like how insane some things are and how jiu jitsu fighters who only do jiu jitsu you know why they don't do any other strength and conditioning some do of course but some don't and like why that matters um, we delve into that a lot I, th- I think you'll like it if you if you give it a shot i'd really appreciate that and i think i think the guy who i talked to Phil Daru would as well all right a couple of questions on this weekend's event how do you see Gunnar Nelson versus Alan Joban going down? It's an interesting matchup. Joban is on a good run, but I just think Gunny is a step above and has been fighting better competition. Well, they have Albert Tumanov in, in common, so you, you can see what happened there. His stand-up is underrated and improving, and outside of Maya, I don't think many want to go to the ground with him. Yeah, so I would really agree with that. I really like Gunnar Nelson in this fight. Now, you never know. Anything can happen. It depends you know, what kind of stance Gunnar Nelson employs, but he can employ an orthodox stance, Joban. Uh, at a southpaw. And um, the thing I notice about Joe Ban is that if he's co- even if he's backing up, if he's striking first, 
uh, and really good about maintaining distance, or if he's coming forward, um, he could be a handful. The problem is he doesn't have necessarily, from what the tape has shown, the best reactive decision-making. Like, Jose Aldo has really good reactive decision-making. Um, Edson Barboza, if you watch the Monday Morning Analyst, like, great reactive decision-making. He can see something and act on it real quickly. What you find is that guys are able to catch Joban at range, um, even on the strong side, um, with any kind of feint and then a long, uh, uh, powerful shot. So, like, a big cross can catch him. It's just clean looking a, not without a setup a big kick to the head can catch him even if he blocks it or has his hand up there in the general space like he just he has a hard time making a decision about something he sees coming uh quickly it looks like to me and that is a bad that's a bad sign for fighting a guy like Gunnar Nelson where Joe Band's good on the ground like he's no slouch but he's obviously not gonna be as good as Gunnar Nelson right so that's going to be probably an avenue he's not going to pursue. And on the feet, a guy like Gunnar Nelson, who does do feints and feints, of course, and, and and whatever, but has really good timing, who can reach long distances and can throw a powerful strike without a setup as a consequence, that's just a nightmare matchup, it seems like to me, for Alan Joban. So, you know, Joban's, I think, a really, really good striker. I think his performance against uh, Mike Perry you know, his ability to constantly maintain distance, to recover when he got hurt, to keep Perry at the end of his jabs, to essentially be so active that Perry can never really get going. I mean, this is tremendous stuff, and he should be complimented for it. I just think stylistically, his ability to get caught at range with a single powerful strike, uh, let go with perfect timing over uh, with great speed and accuracy, that's just a terrible matchup against a guy who strikes in that particular way against Gunnar Nelson. And then he also asks, seeing as Joe Duffy has his last fight on his contract this weekend, I was wondering how you think he'd do in the Bellator lightweight division. Really well. As long as he continues to improve his wrestling and takedown defense at TriStar, I think he'll do very well wherever he ends up. Chandler Duffy could be a great fight down the line, but I really hope he stays with the UFC as I'd love to see him work his way up to fight some of the top guys in the division. Yeah, I mean, wherever he goes, he's going to be competitive. Duffy versus Chandler just screams action fight. I mean, it really does. It reminds me of sort of Duffy Poirier to an extent. Like Poirier and Chandler are very different fighters, but that kind of back and forth, right, the sort of cat fight, um, you would get a lot of that. I mean, I'm happy to see him go wherever he goes. Obviously, he seems to be on a bit of a rough patch with the UFC. Maybe if he goes in there and just puts it on Reza Madati, they'll reconsider or – Maybe he'll reconsider. I, I don't know. But uh, I think that wherever he goes, there are probably some interesting matchups for him. You know, Benson Henderson versus Joe Duffy sounds like a lot of fun to me. Um, less so Patricky Frede, but stranger things have happened. So, uh, you know, well, <laughs> Will Brooks is down the UFC. That's funny. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll just have to see. But he might want to go up to 170, you know, and play that thing up there too. A lot of these UFC guys over there who come to Bellator want to do that. So I guess we'll have to see how that goes. Uh Someone says, you and me, me and you. This got six wrecks for reasons that remain unclear to me. Um, Connor Floyd. I'm not talking about that con job. I'm not talking about that con job. I mean, people love to be con, don't they? <laughs> Like, there's a date set. No, there's not. No, there's not. You know. Oh, they're, you know, the camps are talking a little. A little. You know. Uh, every, every, oh, I'm coming out of retirement, but only for Conor McGregor. Well, how is that any different than what you've been saying? Like, I don't understand the relevance of, the, I mean, it's, this is a con job, you know. I mean, I'm, they, they might fight, right? But, um. The way in which it's being presented just gives me it's like like the biggest red flag territory ever about what a con job this appears to be. So I actually hope they make it. And even if they make it, it's still kind of a con job, right? Like Connor could go in there and shock the world, but in all likelihood, what's probably gonna happen is that Mayweather's gonna bore us in a fight where he just shows that he's demonstrably better at a sport he should be demonstrably better at, one of the best defensive fighters ever against a guy who has not one bout of twelve rounds. You know, it just it's a con job, man. So, like, let's let's save our breath for something else. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on Ali Abdel Aziz? Uh, what are your thoughts on the guy? He seems to have a, every talented fighter a, a, as his client except John Jones and McGregor. Yeah, I think he has... I think he has like a hundred fighters and like 40 or something in the UFC, something crazy. Personally, I think he's a typical snake oil salesman type of guy, type of guy that will tell you what you want to hear, which may not, which may be true or not. Even from Ariel's interviews with him, I can't, I can tell he sounds sketchy. If he doesn't want to answer the question, he will give a random reply that makes it look like he answered, but he just walked around it. So I'm wondering if the fighters he is managing have been fooled or duped in a way because he's probably told them everything they want to hear to become their manager. Well, I, I can't speak to that. I mean, you go, you want to ask these fighters about, you know. I mean, I don't know, man. He must be doing something right. Like, you don't get 100 fighters generally and then 40 or 50 in the UFC by accident. Uh, although it could be, you know, maybe they are all being conned. I don't, I don't really know. I don't have access to any of their contracts. I've never seen them. I don't know what he promises them. I've never been in their private conversations. I've never had anyone... Um, share with me any private details of things he's done or not done. So, you know, I know that there are some reports out there about his background. I don't, I don't, and I'm not saying they're not true. I don't know about the veracity of them, whether they've been independently verified. They might've been, but in any case, in, in my workings with him, which have been, you know, relatively limited, uh, he seems straightforward and, and fair, but like, you know, name to me an MMA manager that you love. Oh, he's so great. You know, like, do they sound, you know, all of them, do they sound like less than reputable characters? Uh, yeah, you know, they're not paid to be ultra likable. They're paid to take care of the interests of that fighters. And in part, they're paid to be the bad guy. If something goes wrong, they're paid to get out there and, and eat, face the firing squad. If they're trying to promote that fighter's interest, even if it's crazy and totally unpalatable to you, that's their job. So they're going to come across negatively, like Moki Kahlo comes across negatively. But um, it appears, I mean, otherwise, I, you know, I suspect people will be leaving him in droves, but there is at least some reason to believe he is serving his client's interest. And again, I can only say that from afar because I've never had a fighter who worked with him ever tell me anything different, which isn't to say it's not true, just I don't have enough information to make a claim otherwise. Um, but... I've never come across a manager that MMA fans were like, oh, he's so great. Mm. You either see them in the public eye and you hate them and you think and you distrust them, and maybe you have good reason to do that, or they sort of keep stay in the shadows and stay to themselves. And they might both be equally awful or whatever the case may be, but I've never I've never heard of an MMA manager. I'm think I'm trying to think hard about one. Like there's Monty Cox out there who, who had a bunch at one time, and um Lenny Fresquez, who manages a Holly Holm and um, you know, GSP's had some lawyers in his corner that served in some kind of managerial capacity, but, and I suppose Anderson Silva's, you know, with Ed Soares is sort of less so in that case, although he's got a couple managers as well. Uh, I don't even know if Ed is still managing him, but it used to be that case anyway. Uh, I think it's, uh, George Green Marsh, I forget how to pronounce his name. In any case, um, they mostly either just stay out of the limelight and, quietly serve their client's interest or they get in the public eye. If you're skeptical of the ones who get in the public eye, fair enough, you know, no issue. But I, I've not heard that, and I have no evidence currently that uh, that's been independently verified to my knowledge that any of these sort of managers you see doing their clients bidding in the public eye um, are taking from them or not serving their interests or... Uh, at least in large numbers, right? I mean, I know Malky got fired fired by Matt Mitrion on TV, but you see what I mean? Like, is there if there if you if you can turn over a rock everywhere, and everywhere you turn over that rock, you see worms. Word gets out about that. Um, that is not a phenomenon I have encountered personally. Take that for what it's worth. GSP Bisping, here's a short question. What do you think GSP or the UFC should do if GSP wins against Bisping? Uh, everything's still working, yes. If GSP wins against Bisping, and what should be done if he loses? So here's what someone else says. I think if GSP loses and still wants to continue fighting, I think UFC will either make the Nick Diaz rematch or fight against Anderson Silva, probably. Especially if Anderson loses. Oh, God. If GSP wins, though, who knows? He has to defend his belt, doesn't he? No, he doesn't. They don't have to defend anything. 
I kind of hope he doesn't, though, because the division will all be messed up. Pretty sure Woodley will be calling him out, and probably Anderson Silva, too, especially if he beats Gastelum, and UFC might well seriously agree uh, to it, thus screwing over the middleweight contenders again. Yeah, everyone's like, oh, if he wins a title, he has to defend it. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He can sit on it and go back to welterweight. Um, he can let it go and not defend it. He can do anything he wants. Uh, he can wait until he's stripped before he does anything with it, like... This idea that if St. Pierre beats Michael Bisping, well, you got to face the number one contender next. This is those days are over. <laughs> they have there maybe they've been over for a while, but they're definitely over now. There's absolutely there's there's no mechanism to compel him to do that. None. It's not even clear that the biggest fight he could make would be that one. And if that were the case, then you could. But like, where is the rule? And uh, uh, I mean, the precedence is there, but where is the rule that states he has to do any of this stuff? And now that Connor is sort of doing whatever he's doing, and I'm not mad at him for it. You know, he's doing what he thinks is best, I suppose. But um, I guess I'm a little bit mad about it, but not like. Mm. But th there's nothing to compel them; they don't have to do anything. There's ultimately a cost to be paid for that if you don't defend it. You know, UFC will assert itself in a way against your interests, but that takes time. And we know St. Pierre can go back down to 170 probably without too much issue. Hell, he might be able to go to 155 even after going to 185, depending on all the things he said. So, um, so no, I don't think they have to do that at all. They might end up creating an interim title, and they might. It might. And if if what's his face, if Silva wins, who knows? They might actually do Silva versus Romero for an interim title. Like this is the problem. This is why there needs to be a fighter association or some kind of association or entity that acts on the fighter's behalf. And that codifies some, I mean, they still need to be kind of loose, but some kind of rule about um, title defenses, how long you can wait, what if you're injured, what's the process. There needs to be a formalized process in mind so we know what the fighters can and can't do. And so the fighters know what they can and can't do. And it's rules themselves that in totality, um, through representative uh, representatives anyway, that we'll have agreed to. But just leaving it out into the open air, F McGregor is the first person to show that like, to really show that like there's no rules to this i can do whatever i can reasonably get away with and that's what i'm going to do because the ufc has been doing that the ufc is going to do whatever they can reasonably get away with they ultimately have the power to strip or whatever the case may be create titles and you get that they have a little bit more power but but it's the same process so mcgregor just turned it on his head and said i'm going to do the same thing with whatever power i have um and so now I think you might see other champions follow suit, depending if they can jump weight classes and there might be more lucrative fights as they jump. So what are they going to do? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, this is, we are in, we are in a very weird place in the sport right now. But I think if you're thinking, well, GSP will just fight Romero when, if and when he beats Michael. Doubt that severely. I doubt that. I think he'll fight the biggest fight he can on his way out the door and nothing else. Okay. Uh, was it a surprise that Tony, I think you're talking about Tony Ferguson didn't get his show money. I thought MMA journalists would know things like this. They do. I talked about this extensively on my radio show. Do details such as these, e.g. what happens if your opponent can't fight vary a lot from contract to contract. Nope. Is it very rare for MMA journalists to see fighters contracts? Yep. And the truth is, we've not seen Tony's. It could be possible that Tony's has some differences included. But I've been given, I have a, I have a UFC fighter's contract. Let me pull it up and read it to you. That one of his a manager sent me. Um, let's see. I have his contract his manager sent me. An about agreement. Promotional agreement. Here, here's the about agreement. And I'm going to find the section. So you all can hear it. But compensation. There's all kinds of different ways the fighter is compensated. Uh, let's see.
there are there are clauses if, if about is canceled due to like insane circumstances, you know, uh, natural disaster, uh, fire, unrest, civil unrest, labor difficulties, that kind of thing. Um, trying to see where, just so you guys have an. Oh, here we go. Now I got it. All right. Okay. And actually, I think this is the promotional agreement. So it's not. So the way it works in Vegas is it says you need to be paid according to whatever it says in the bout agreement. The bout agreement is I, the one I just saw didn't really specify it. But certainly the promotional agreement has some of this essentially um, covered. Here we go. Hold on. Compensation. Assignment. Other activities. Commercial identification. Blah, 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 blah. I'll have to find it later, but here's what it basically says. And I went over this on my show. I'll see if I can link out the segment where I discuss this. Basically what the contracts I've seen, and they could vary depending on what they are. You know, we don't know exactly what Tony says and doesn't, but to the extent it's specified in the bout agreement or to the extent that it's specified in their contracts, um, it has the, the words show money don't ever appear. Just the, it doesn't appear. What you get is purse and bonus. It's, it's described. And of course, that you might think of that as show and win money, but it's not described as such. But the point being is, um, you are entitled to them contractually upon the completion of the bout. That's what the contract. That's what the typical contract language says. Is Tony's different? I don't know, but typically that's the way it works. Now, you're not entitled to anything. So the we, we, the, pro, the the main takeaway you should have is that there's no such thing as show money. There is a split in the purse, as we understand it, sort of. There's the purse and then the bonus. Uh, and you're entitled to the bonus, of course, if you win or whatever the case may be. And there's, you know, the more fights you have, the more the money goes up. If you're fighting for a title, the money changes. All these things are articulated and spelled out. The key consideration is that thinking of something like, well, if you show, you win. This is a nonsense argument that doesn't exist anywhere. It, there's, no, there's nothing about that that's real. There's nothing about that that's real, at least contractually. We talk about it like it's real. It's not real. There's no such process as showing. Now, I think some states, someone told me Virginia tried to do that, where if you make weight and your opponent doesn't, you are entitled to your your uh, your purse, not your bonus, or or you know, and maybe maybe other organizations do that differently, but but the UFC doesn't do it that way. Uh, and of course, we're talking about a UFC contract and a UFC fighter and a UFC event. So to me, the big takeaway is um, fighters are signing contracts that don't really challenge this very often, if at all. They don't have any way to get guaranteed money before a bout is completed. That, that seems to me to be the lesson here. So if I'm a fighter... And I'm facing someone who has missed weight before. I would probably want to sign a bout agreement that has some kind of stipulation that if they fail to make weight, I'm at least entitled to the purse, not the bonus. Um, easier said than done, but that's that. So that should be your takeaway. There is no such thing, insofar as the UFC is concerned or the state of Nevada is concerned, as show money. It is a thing we discuss that doesn't really exist, at least not in the way we think about it. So I feel bad for Tony. I really do. If anyone should have gotten his purse, um, did everything they asked of him, did all the media, you know, when you go and you interview these guys and you can hear their lips stick to their gums because nothing but the leftover residue film is putting it all together because there's no saliva in there because they're absolutely dehydrated. You know, you feel bad for those guys, man. And when he trains his ass off and he spends money and literally remodels his home to get to prepare for things like that, you want them to have insurance in the event of disaster. That's really what some of those clauses should be. And we talked about MMA managers before. Is Ali providing that for his fighters? Is Malky providing that for his fighters? These are reasonable questions to be asked. Um, I don't know that any manager is, to, to be honest. But, you know, the public ones, th this is something that they should take seriously. You know, if you really want to care for your fighter and you've got uh, fighters who are in championship position and they need to train at a championship level and they don't have any clauses in any of their promotional or bout agreements that specifies they're entitled to certain monies, in the event of some kind of disaster out of their control up to a certain date or point in the fight week, 
you know, are you really serving your client to the maximum amount that you could be? Um, good question. That to me is the bigger issue here. But like literally, let's say the UFC gave him a hundred grand, Tony. They they didn't have to give him any of that. They literally gave him a hundred grand beyond what the contract stipulated. And you might say, well, he was going to get 250 no matter what. And I hear you, but he signed a deal saying, I only get paid when the bout is over. So for them to give him a hundred grand, <laughs> you can see why the UFC feels like we just did you a solid. We just gave you six figures when we didn't have to give you a penny. A penny. So people were asking, like, is the UFC in breach of contract? First of all, no. The UFC is almost never in breach of contract. They, they, they very much mind their P's and Q's. But the other takeaway, of course, is that, like, why would they be in breach of a contract in a scenario where that contract heavily favors them? They don't need to be in breach. They need to be in compliance. Compliance serves their interest. All right? Uh, you can do check his dislike of Nama Yunus. Right. On the MMA hour, Yin Jacek once again made it very clear that she does not like Rose Nama Yunus. She did it on my show as well, too. So it must be either serious or some kind of promotional stunt. Although this time I thought I understood her reasoning for it, as she seems to dislike that Nama Yunus had called her out despite having come up short in those big matches that would put her in championship discussion. Also, you know, hey, I met you face to face and you were real nice, and after the fact, you weren't. So JJ apparently feels that Nama Yunus is just trying to draw attention to herself by bringing up JJ instead of earning it by showing her worth, again, if I understood correctly. Yeah, more or less. How do you feel about Yin Jacek's comments and views about Nama Yunus? Don't care. Especially in this new era of UFC matchmaking. You know, partly it could be signaling that she thinks that she's going to beat Michelle Waterson, and so she's setting up a natural rivalry. Yin Jacek is a very, very clever self-promoter and, um, you know, again, input matchmaker kind of thing. So... It could be just that. Maybe it's real genuine hostility. I don't know. You know, these fighters sort of are hard to read sometimes about what their true motivations are unless you really know them. A lot of this, yeah, guys have to understand. Like, There's a lot of times where I've talked to fighters, and a lot of it is just kabuki theater for the, for the fan base. So, you know, uh, I don't mean to be negative towards the question, but there is a lot of is merely things said for public consumption that have almost no bearing on the real world. This is a very common thing. And and deciphering what's real and what's not, if you don't know that person or the persons, admittedly can be very difficult, but this one feels a little bit weird. Uh, are you surprised that Injicek's much harsher towards Nama Yunus than Andraj? No. Um, she used to train with Andraj, is what she told me. And so... You know, yes, they're going to fight, and they didn't train like extensively together, but they trained a little bit together. And um, I spoke to her; she had really fond things to say about her, or you know, at least okay for Ian Jacek, who can be very, very uh, cruel towards opposition, as you well know. Relative to that baseline, she was, I thought, very friendly towards Andraj. Now, certainly, said she was a tough challenge and everything like that, but um, I, I wonder if this is just setting up the next match or potential title contender or whatever the case may be. Um, that that seems to be more what this might be about than any sort of like, oh, you were nice to me in person. Right? Maybe it is. But even if, that, if that's the case, I don't care. And if the other one's the case, then I care about it only insofar as what its utilitarian purpose might be. And also someone says, JJ hates everyone in the 115 division. There's a little bit of that too. There's a little bit of that too. Joanna's title defenses. Luke, Joanna said that she's looking to surpass Rousey and then DJ's record. Beating Rousey's record is possible. She's almost there. But looking at the strawweight division, do you think Joanna can beat DJ's record of nine title defenses? And which contenders do you think the money fights are for her? She, the money fights are going to be when she jumps out of the weight class, insofar as I can tell. Um, all. Um, look, let's see her get past Andrade, man. You know? Injicek is supremely talented. There's no question about it. But she seems to be remarkably better than her peers. But Andrade also appears to be a, a fairly unique challenge. Um, 
if she can breeze by her, then sky's the limit, you know, because after that, it's like, who, 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 she, who, who will she face that could challenge her? Watterson, Nama Yunus, you know, I would favor Ian Jacek pretty cleanly over both of those. A rematch with Esparza, you know, Penny, like all, all of those, you know, Paige Van Zant, like n- none, of, none of those. And Raj appears to be, to me, the very toughest challenge. So if she can get by her, I think she can probably do a lot if she can stay healthy and continues to be active in terms of setting and breaking records. Also, DJ is going to keep keep going with his record as well, you know, presumably uh, against Wilson Hayes. So that that one is still in motion. But is she going to beat Rousey's? I'm very confident saying she'll. Well, the Andrade one kind of challenges that a little bit, but you get my point. The Andrade one is a very unique challenge. You know, coming from bantamweight down to strawweight, looking amazing. Uh, you know, providing physical challenges to UJ Check in ways that no one ever has. That one is a real eye opener. I think UFC 211 is going to be really, really interesting to see how she does. But if she can just breeze by her, it's hard to see after that what really could stop her. Aside from an off day, injury, someone having a really on day, you know, MMA is crazy. We all know that. Anyone can win at any time. But reasonably speaking, there would be a high degree of confidence in her ability after the Andrade fight if she gets through that successfully and thinking that she can basically, you know, cruise at that point. Or scoring in a bubble. Not sure what that is. More scoring in a bubble. Oh, we really haven't talked about this Kelvin Gastelum fight at all. Let me answer this one. How does Masvidal beat Maya? I don't favor Masvidal in his matchup with Maya, even though Masvidal had been looking really good lately. I think Maya is a poor stylistic match for game bread and wonder how Masvidal deals with Maya's usual game plan of takedown guard pass victory. Well, so I believe that's UFC 211 as well, if I'm not mistaken. It's going to be insane. So that means it's a three round fight, which means it's not in Jorge's favor off the break. But I think there are a couple things that serve Jorge's interests. Number one, Jorge has very good jiu-jitsu, both defensive and offensive. Not nearly as good as Demi and Myers, of course, but good. He has good wrestling. He has good recovery. He can bounce back to his feet pretty well. You add those things in, and you could say, well, Demian's better in all of those. Right. Demian might be able to get the take. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Demian's going to get his back at some point. Um, but Matt Brown, you saw, was able to fend it off at least for a little while. In the end, he ultimately succumbed. So I'm not saying that Matt Brown fight is like a blueprint for success far from it i think what i'm saying is there is reasons to believe that masvidal will be able to reset the fight at different portions um stop takedowns from ever happening in certain occasions and to the extent he can really hurt demi and maya uh on um he can he can has a chance it's not much of a chance all i'm pointing out to you is just thinking maya's going to go in there lock up with him yank him to the ground take his back and then that's all it will be Certainly, we've seen him do that with very good guys, but I just mean to say, I think we're sleeping on Masvidal's fundamentals and wrestling fundamentals and his ability to scramble here. It's going to be a tougher fight for Maya than I think some might imagine. I favor Maya to win for all the reasons I've already mentioned. But if somehow uh, Jorge was able to stop the fight at certain point or uh, stop takedowns at certain points and land hard shots, Depending on that, in fact, in fact, I, I suspect that will happen at some point. I suspect you will get a desperation shot at one point or another. I, you know, look, there are great grapplers down there at ATT who can mimic what, not exactly, but they can mimic to, to an extent what Demian's going to do. He is good on the mat. Um, if he can find open shots in in ground and pound, in transition, and 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 find ways to step out of things. Again, it's just so difficult to do. I understand. I'm favoring Demi and Maya. I can't be clear about that. I just feel like lunch, but it's a doable thing for my husband all to win. Difficult, not likely, but doable. That card is amazing, by the way. Uh, someone says, who is Valentina Shevchenko? So following her on social media, I sense she's a... Uh, Pakistani native, Peruvian transplant, fluent in Russian, Spanish, and English, who lives primarily in Houston but trains at a new location every camp, more or less. 
has a ridiculous kickboxing pedigree, appears to be a high-level dancer, that's true, and a trained combat professional that routinely embraces a Texas cowgirl role while unafraid to slip into a dress and has a dark-haired twin sister who is also a kickboxer. So you forgot she is a competitive shooter. Literally. She has that Glock tattooed on her stomach. I asked her what her favorite gun is. Pistol. And she told me the Glock 17. So keep that in mind. She's a competitive shooter as well. Excuse me if I ask who Valentina Shevchenko, who is Valentina Shevchenko, and why is the UFC not doing a running documentary exploring the close question, let alone promoting someone who can literally speak to three huge Spanish language markets seriously what's her story and how did she end up in peru usa oh and who is her coach pavel uh fedotov who i would otherwise mistake as my dad's pipe fitter union buddy <laughs> um uh okay so she grew up as a dancer in in kyrgyzstan uh picked it up when she went to peru which she followed uh love or a, a loved one essentially um, and a coach. And um, that's where she picked up all kinds of different dance. She's been on Peruvian national TV doing all kinds of different dancing, salsa, merengue, like you name it. She's been there eight years, so she picked up Spanish. Her, I, I would say her Spanish is better than her English. And she has kept up competitive shooting. I, I don't know how often she competes, but she certainly practices pretty routinely. Like, she's she's remarkable. She is truly, truly remarkable. Now, I don't know enough about her coach to give you a lot of helpful information on that, and so for that, I apologize. Someone says, Valentina and Antonina don't look like sisters at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not saying that she does. That was him, not me. But um, this is sort of what I talked about previously, which is there are going to be people out there who have these incredible stories. You know, Demetrius Johnson's story is that he is, you know, we, we know it in the cage what it is, but outside the cage, he was a family guy, big gamer. It's sort of his identity, and there's an audience behind that. How you reach out to that and cultivate that identity and make use of that, I think, is not easy to do, but probably could be a better job being done of it. And I think Valentina Shevchenko is the same way. You know, you've got this incredible, I mean, she is, there's, there's no one like her. There's no one like her. A competitive fighter, competitive dancer, competitive shooter, fluent in three languages. Um, who is an absolute ferociously talented person inside the cage. That is who is like that in the UFC, and it, male or female, that you know, you know, nobody. Um, you, you see some people who are trilingual like Santiago Ponzinibbio, but, you know, does he do all those other things as well? Like it's hard to be good at any one thing in life, um, much less two or three of them. And she is. I don't know when she has any time for anything else. She must just be so naturally gifted that it just isn't as much work for her as it could be for others. But I think my my point is um, there are lots of people who have interesting stories to tell. Not everyone is capable of telling them. UFC is really good about telling certain kinds of stories. They're not necessarily that great at telling other kinds. That doesn't mean those other kinds are less interesting in fact, there might be more, but you have to ask, what is this storyteller able to do, reasonably speaking? What are the kinds of fighters that they're better at telling? They're better at telling these stories about big personalities, typically, or people who have, um, who have followed pathways that people can readily identify with. Right, so Daniel Cormier is a, is a pretty big personality, but you know, two-time member of the Olympic team. You know, Conor McGregor has not the Olympic story, but is this incredible athlete, right? Um, and this, in this larger life personality, and GSP is not so much a larger life personality, but this incredible athletic phenom who put a country on his back and represents that identity, and and you know, came at a time when no one looked like him or could fight like him, and just sort of took over and fought like the the better fighters in the division. You know, Matt Hughes was an icon at that time. You know, that kind of a thing. Valentina is not a big personality. She or or she is, but not verbally and not outwardly in terms of her non-competitive. And I think that makes it a little bit of a hard story to tell. You know, also like, you know, to what extent do Americans care that she's on Peruvian TV? I mean, I'm maybe they care, maybe they don't, but um th this requires a deft hand at storytelling. And the UFC does have one but not for every kind of fighter and every kind of scenario. They really are kind of lacking in that regard. And so, um, which is understandable. Like, can you be good at telling everyone's story? A really adept storyteller could. 
Um, but even a very good one is going to be limited. Even a very good one. And also, do they really want to invest in telling her story? Like, there might be a signal-to-noise ratio here. Like, how hard would it be to tell her story and then just to see her fall flat against Amanda Nunes? You know? That. And so, a lot of times, it's like, after someone becomes a proven thing, then everyone begins to jump on. But um, as it stands, she's fairly demure in her personality insofar as verbal communication and sort of outward interaction is concerned. She, when you have her on the radio, she comes on my show all the time. She's very pleasant and and minds her manners and things like you know what I mean. Like she's you wouldn't really gather that she is all these things from from speaking with her or by looking at her. And so you need someone who can bridge that gap, and that's not an easy, obvious thing to do. Uh, the MM Triple A. Do you think they kind of blew it because Bjorn acted the way he did when they made their announcement? A little bit. I think their progress largely depends on momentum, and it looks like whatever momentum they had came to a screeching halt. Connor made fun of them at this Q&A. was the final nail in the coffin for me. I don't know why that would be the final nail in the coffin. Uh, if they are close to being done, and I don't think they are, how much would you think they lost in terms of investment made to this point? Oh, hundreds of thousands, if not more. I mean, there was a process there in the work and the works there for a while. There are reasons to believe this is related to um, uh, a CAA effort, either aimed at, uh, you know, show promotion or contractual control. There's there's a lot going on here that has not been fully revealed or fully understood. To be honest, um, I don't think they're quite dead yet. But I spoke to Cole Miller, who had positive things to say about him, and I was like, you know, did you have a conversation with him? And this was a while ago, back in 2016, late 2016. I was like, have you heard from them since? He said, no. Like, I don't, it's not it's not clear what they're doing. Um, you know, Bjorn had reached out to me about having a conversation to see where he was at. And I said, sure. And then all that backlash hit um, where he was like, what's Bjorn doing? Da, 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 da. And it, which I was part of, of course, to an extent because I just didn't understand it. And that's why he actually reached out to me. But then when it reached critical mass, he went radio silent. And so I never had a chance uh, to talk to him. Um, you know, Eddie Alvarez, interestingly, had very funny things to say in comparing it to a hacker that the FBI caught and then using that hacker for the FBI's purposes or, you know, CIA or whatever the case may be. But, um, yeah, their momentum is – I mean, I'm, I'm, like, legitimately worried about the state of the future of – the state and future of uh, fighter associations. The PFA is, I mean, all but dead. Um the MMA FA is alive and ticking. Those guys come to DC all the time. When I went to UFC 209, they had Kung Lee come to town, uh, as well as some others. I wasn't there to interview them because I was in Las Vegas, but they're active on the Hill. Now, ultimately, I don't think that bill is going to be successful. It has some support, but I think less than 15 um, members who have signed on um, to advance the cause. Uh, even if it gets to the floor, I don't, I'd be surprised if it really goes anywhere. I don't even know if it'll get to the floor, to be honest. And I also, and I've asked them this because you get guys like Askren who have gone, guys like John Fitch who have gone, guys like Randy Couture who have gone, who have were vocal Trump supporters. That I mean, unless it's a, a bill attached to something else, almost as like a, a rider, um, then maybe it wouldn't. But if it stands alone to, in any capacity, I am very confident Trump would veto that. You know, given his connections to um, the folks who run WME and less so Dana White, I suppose, but certainly Ari Emanuel. I mean, Ari Emanuel is an incredibly powerful guy who is persuasive and can do a lot. And I'm, I don't think Trump would ever sign legislation intentionally and purposefully. I mean, it would, I, you know, I, it, would it blow up the MMA industry? I don't think it would do that. In some ways, depending on what the legislation would look like, maybe it wouldn't do much. But if it went in the ways in which we thought it might, and could, um, where essentially these promoters are bidding on the services independently with an independent ranking system of fighters, this would fundamentally restructure MMA. I don't, I don't buy that Trump would sign on to something like that. I could be wrong, you know, we could all be wrong, but this to me just seems like it's way too many hurdles. So really what's going to be the, what's going to be the end result? Is the MMA FA going to work? Maybe. PFA seems all but dead. MM, AAA. I don't know what they're doing. You don't hear anything from TJ Dillashaw or Tim Kennedy. Certainly Cain Velasquez is not an early vocal supporter. What is Donald Cerrone doing? GSP still upholding it, but you know, there's not there's no news. There's no nothing. There's no contact. There's no um and so to that extent I feel like it's a uh 
cause for concern, to put it mildly. And I think putting Bjorn out there was bad. But if they had here, – here was the problem. Putting Bjorn out there in the way they did was not wise. But then they doubled down on that by taking him out and then going silent. That, to me, was what compounded that failure. It would be one thing if they took him out and then got right back on the horse and said, you know, he's going to be advising when the back roll and they were, they were sharing news – and they were holding summits, and they were out there. You know, look, you can say what you know about Jeff Boris, but he was out there at events, holding events, being seen, public, the works. They're not doing anything. They're not even tweeting. And so to me, it, that's the compound failure there. Weight psychology. Luke, is the belief that a fighter needs to be as big as possible for a given weight class flawed? A few times. Uh, okay, here's one I like. Dylan Dennis signing with Bellator. So Dennis has now signed with Bellator, and based on his interviews, he wants to debut sooner rather than later. From a competitive aspect, how do you think his grappling skills will translate into MMA grappling? Also, what does this signing say about the direction Bellator are going? Bellator's direction is the same as it's always been. Sign from the top, uh, top down and build from the bottom up. And so this is a combination to an extent of both, but um, I love this signing. For both parties, Dylan Dennis, I think, is obviously a tremendous talent uh, on the mat. And but you know, just thrusting him into the UFC, I know he was calling out Nate Diaz. I, I, I respect his ambition, but that is at this stage delusions of grandeur. But we do know he's very talented, and we do know he's very young. In Bellator, he can enjoy just the right amount of spotlight as he gets just the right kind of challenge. And everyone's going to be like, he's going to be taking you know matches where he blows guys out early. That's what you're supposed to do. Works. If you're if you're a blue chip prospect, you're not supposed to go in there and fight these like ridiculously tough challenges early. You you gradually increase the level of of difficulty, and so he can get all that and be seen and do a and promote them. Who knows? Conor McGregor might even be at some of these events. You never know. Uh, but in any case, this is this is great for both parties. The only thing that's sort of a bummer to me was that he has done well at like the at the pans uh, at black belt. And some other major tournaments, but he hasn't won the worlds as a black belt. And I was kind of hoping that he would, because that's really, that's real. I mean, he made his name as a brown belt. I mean, he was hitting. I mean, he Dylan Dennis is just in the gi and no gi, amazing. I prefer his gi game personally because it's so dynamic and he hits from so many angles, and he can just. It's just phenomenal. I mean, his gi game is out of control. Good. Um, you know, you're beating guys like Edwin, Edwin Najmi and, and, um, uh, Santana, <laughs> you know, you're doing something right. But in any case, he never won the world as a black belt. I was really hoping that he would. I'm not saying that he can't or won't now, but I felt like, you know, it's going to sound corny, but I kind of felt like it was his destiny. You know, he was part of that Brown belt crew coming out of Mar Marcello's and it was him, uh, uh, Mansur Kara, um, uh, Jonathan, I think it's Sativa or Satava, Satava, I think. Sativa is like kind of cannabis. But uh, there's a bunch of, there's more. There's a bunch of brown belts that were all together, like this brown belt all star team out of Marcelo Garcia's. And if you guys weren't following this, this is like 2014, they were tearing people to pieces, competition after competition after competition. And they've all been promoted to black belt at this point. But, um, Guys fulfilled their destiny. I want to see those guys go out there and, and win, you know, in May level at the world's um at the world championship. That really kind of I don't know. Again, they've got different priorities and I've got different priorities. I would really like to see that. I feel it's kind of important. And not that it's a shame that he's going to build tour, far from it. It's great. It's amazing. I love it. But I don't know. It's like I don't know how to explain it exactly, but it's you want to see greatness fulfilled. And I know Dylan Danis rubs people the wrong way on social media. I don't know what he's doing with that. It seems so artificial, but but as a competitor, he he is the genuine article. And as a talent, he is the genuine article. And he's only 23. Uh I would it, it would be to me disappointing if I never got to see him fully commit to winning tournaments at the black belt level. But I can't hate on the deal, man. It's a great signing for both guys. Really smart by Bellator. A nice signing for them. They can sign guys. 
This is what I mean. CM Punk should have signed with Bellator. It make way more sense for them because they could give him the right kind of fight on the right kind of stage. He wouldn't have to fight guys that were just way better than him. Podcast, by the way, with uh, Jamie Josta, the lead singer of Hatebreed, and I guess he's friends with um, CM Punk. And I don't know that CM Punk told him this, but this was sort of his assessment. Like he wants to fight, and he's just waiting to hear, and he's not hearing anything. And I agree. If you've got a contract with this guy, and you agreed to give him fights, you got to figure something out, man. Like he needs, like he's not going to get any better not competing. That's why I would have made way more sense if you're a guy like CM, if you're an athlete out there who is, um, you know, newish to MMA, but you have some kind of promotional pull or you're matriculating from another sport and you can already be a popular attraction, but you need to get the reps in in the cage against limited opposition. It, I'm not, I, I'm not, but I can just observe quite clearly it makes way more sense to go to, to Bellator than it does to go to UFC in that particular context, unless you're someone who's super advanced already or the division is weak and you're like a Brock Lesnar or something like that, where within two fights you're already competing with the, with the division's, you know, opponents. So it's a great signing by Bellator. I just hope we get to see the best of Dylan Danis still in those jiu-jitsu mats. That, 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 that would be a, a loss to me if we don't get to see that. Uh, someone says, this World Series of fighting card, do you feel Sean Jordan's athleticism and strength is too much for a diminished uh, uh, Lagoy Ivanov? I do. And by the way, there's another kid on that card who has caught my attention. Real quickly, then we'll go to the Twitter machine here. This, pay attention to this kid. Doesn't get hardly any publicity, but he should. Uh, Lance Palmer is fighting a guy named Andre Harrison. Now, Andre Harrison is 15-0. and 0, Okay. Here are his fights. Ready? Bruce uh, Boynton. Nobody beat him in the first round. Then he beat uh, Alashanje Bezeha from previously from Bellator. Uh, he beat, um, let's see, Steven Seiler. Split decision, but still he won. Des Green he beat. Um, Kurt Holaba, Strike Force vet. Cody Bollinger, UFC vet. Uh, and I can go on down the list. Now, a lot of these are decision. Some of these are something else. I'm just saying... Andre Harrison, 15-0, and has beaten a ton of strike force and UFC vets and Bellator vets. That's a kid to pay attention to. All right. With that, let's go to the Twitter machine if we can and get some of these in. Someone says, boss had me fill in one for the first time ever, talking about a bracket. I haven't done a bracket in three. This will be my third year running, and it feels so good. I love all these people who do their brackets. They're like, oh, can you believe it? Jenny, the secretary won. Yeah, I can believe it because none of you dildos know anything about college basketball or how to do these brackets or anything else. There is no such thing as a bracketologist. There is no such thing as bracketologist. You know who's a bracketologist? I'll tell you who's a bracketologist. Some pimply idiot kid sitting in his dorm room at MIT who's real good at math uh, and statistics and putting together um, some kind of uh, algorithm to predict outcomes based on probability that's that's your bracketologist right there everyone else who's like i've been watching duke and kentucky and blah blah i don't care you, you don't know anything your your bracket will bust like everyone else's it'll be marginally better and i could take a colobus monkey uh no nay a howler monkey and have him ask him to sling his feces at a wall and whichever chunk it hits close to the individual brackets i can put an x mark in there and that will be better than your bracket because no one knows anything about how to do this correctly except math nerds. That's it. So I don't do them anymore. They're ridiculous. They're pointless. I get busted. Good. I'm not surprised because none of you know anything about brackets. Only that math nerd at MIT does. All right. Nami Yunus versus Watterson. Will the fight be mostly grappling on the ground or stand-up clinch? I think it's going to be a nice mix, actually. Uh, and who wins? I favor Nami Yunus, but I could be wrong. Someone sent me a picture of uh, uh, the the shirt he purchased. Says, been listening since the beginning. Stoked to support the animals. Thank you, buddy. Really appreciate that. Uh, oh, good stuff. Love it. Um, okay. If Nelson and Amir Khani, someone says, be a man, do an NCAA wrestling bracket, which they do with the same kind of bracket for every weight class. Okay. And by the way, 
the NCAA tournament is this week, and you're going to hear so much about how they should grow wrestling. Don't believe them. I'm not talking about individual coaches and individual colleges. That's not what I'm saying. But the people who run NCAA wrestling and that organization, they need to grow wrestling. Uh, if Nelson and Amir Khani have impressive wins on Saturday, where does it put both in their respective divisions? Ooh, good question. Um, so, I know we don't know the rankings are a LOL joke, but they are a helpful guideline nevertheless. So, currently, as it stands, Gunnar Nelson's at nine. If he beats Dan, who is not nine, it doesn't necessarily bump him up too much, but it could bump him past Cerrone at eight, maybe even Dong Hyun Kim. It won't go past Jorge Maswell, although who's at six. So a limited bump, I think it could offer him. And as for Amir Khani, wow, I don't know, entering the top 15? Yeah, I think that's what he's looking for. Uh, okay, let's see. What do you think a fight between Kelvin Gastelum and Luke Rockhold will go? I, I like watching Kelvin Gastelum at middleweight. I mean, he's doing really well, and this signing – to face Anderson Silva seems to be very much a win scenario for him. But uh, I still fundamentally believe when he gets to the upper echelon of the division, just the size disparity will manifest itself in ways that it hasn't yet. Um, so I favor Luke Rockhold to win. I'm not exactly sure by what. I mean, he's got excellent takedown defense, and he could fight at range in ways that Kelvin can't. So if he's mindful about his range, then that's how Bisping got him. But... To the extent that he is, that's his fight to lose, it feels like to me. Who do you think Bisping... Why do you think Bisping beats GSP? Couldn't GSP take him down and submit him? GSP could do that, of course. We saw what Tim Kennedy did to Bisping, but I feel like defense has dramatically improved since then. And I also believe that um, this, the size disparity is not quite what I thought it was, but... I, I still fun, fundamentally believe that Bisping... I think people will just sleep on Bisping all the time. You know, so... Um, but, you know, look, if GSP takes him down over and over and... Sub, I mean, he couldn't submit Dan Hardy. I'm not sure why he would submit. I don't think he submits him. I, I'd be very surprised by that. But taking him down, sure, a little bit. I just think in the end, Bisping's so good at getting up and it's against a smaller guy who is strong but probably is not as strong pound for pound as Tim Kennedy. So, or aggregately, I should say, as Tim Kennedy. So... There you go. One says, Luke, Army vet here. Speaking of barbaric training, what's the dumbest thing you did for PT while in the Army? Well, I wasn't in the Army. I was in the Marines. Um, Jesus, the dumbest thing. I mean, <laughs> where do I even start? Uh, you know, they just, there's all kinds of like uh, things when you do something wrong, they torture you, you know. Get uh, you know, get in the sand pit, put your head in the sand, and you're getting there bit by sand fleas, and you got to do six inches for two hours, you know, things like that, where your stomach can no longer even support the weight of your feet, and your your organs hurt two days afterwards, you know, things like that. Um, the most exhausting thing I've ever done, I think, was like a, an eleven mile speed race in Boots and Utes at Twenty Nine Palms. That sucked. That sucked a lot. I had the worst. I had shin splints so bad after that. Is there any way to make a big payday for the fighters except the pay-per-view model since the sport is growing? Um, unless there's some addendum to the contract, the bigger money comes from title fights. So title fights on pay-per-view is really where that sweet spot is unless you have some kind of contractual provision that says otherwise. Progress with recent news of the California State Athletic Commission fining for missing weight to include show and win money. Uh, does it go to the CSAC or the opponent? Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Do we know the answer to that? By the way, the fining part, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Um, because I, I'm not against it. I'm not for it. I'm just curious to see if it has what, what effect it has one way or the other. Here's what it says. Fighters win bonus in addition to his or her show money when that fighter misses weight. Blah, 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 blah. Foster has the ability to make the change administratively in the language. Yada, yada, yada. Previously, CSAC fined fighters 20% for missing weight with the money coming out of their show money only. 
half of that percentage went to their opponent and the other half went to the commission. Now, in addition to that, a fighter who misses weight will have his or her bonus fine 20% with that full total goading to the opponent. The win bonus fine will only come into play, of course, if the fighter who misses weight is victorious in the bout. Foster said the win bonus in MMA should be treated as part of the person, the commission, in these circumstances, and at 20% of the fine of the show money is not enough of the deterrent for fighters. Yada, yada, yada. So there you go. Uh, okay. In your opinion, what form of striking discipline is most effective for MMA, boxing, Muay Thai, or kickboxing? I'm still a believer in Muay Thai a little bit, but you have to do. You can't just borrow one style at this point. And I don't mean that to say the obvious, which that is, but you got to take one style. The reason why I like Muay Thai is because you can just work things at range, in tight, out close, even in the middle. But then you have to really add things to it. You have to do what TJ Dillashaw is doing and Dominic Cruz, and not so much with the fancy footwork in and of itself. But you need to add wrinkles and forms of attack to it. You know. Also, don't sleep on San Shao. I still like what Kung Lee was able to do a little bit. I've been reading his book. So I'm a little bit biased at the moment in, um, about the value of San Shao. And, of course, good training on like that is hard to find. But um, to the extent you can find a fight at different ranges, to the extent you can fight in different in different ways, to the extent you have access to the kinds of elite forms of training that you're provided, um, then it's good. But, like, have a base, have something you're really good at, and then add wrinkles to it all the way around that make it different and unique and hard to game plan for and original and challenging. And I think that's really the key. So for me, I like the, I, I think I believe that Muay Thai probably is best, but only uh, not like pure Muay Thai, a base of Muay Thai with branches grown in unique and organic directions. But you can find people who don't do that, who can be more successful than the other person who tries different styles. Like let's be clear about that. I'm just saying, generally speaking, uh, what do you make of Mackenzie Dern's ever developing accent? Yeah, there's like a video where years ago she was a blue belt and she had a very little accent, and now even more she's got one. It just seems to me like she just spends more time with Brazilians speaking in Portuguese than she does in English, and that's why it's happened that way. I don't think it's much of a scandal. It's just kind of usually people go another direction or they maintain what they're able to have. I'm told that um, Henry Kissinger moved out of. Uh, Germany, what year? I got told this by someone. I'm not sure it's entirely true. Um, yeah, he moved out of Germany at... God, he's 93 years old. He moved out of Germany at such a formative age that he was fluent in English and German, but at the time in which he moved, he... Um, formative age such that he has a German accent in English and I don't think he has an English accent in German but he has some kind of other affected way in which he speaks German um, he doesn't have a native, a perfectly native accent in any of the languages he speaks uh, so languages can be a funny thing in terms of when you pick them up and how often you use them and in what contexts so to me that she spoke with less of an accent previously and more of one now especially now that she's still only 23 years old, we can identify reasons for that. That's not altogether mysterious or some put on, I don't think. Let's see. Any thoughts on Alex Jones challenging Alec Baldwin to a bare knuckle fight? Don't care. Luke, do you think Yair Rodriguez will be fast-tracked to a title shot if he beats Edgar at UFC 211? Yes. Yes. Because just think about it. If Edgar loses... Uh, Okay, well, think about this. If Holloway wins, it changes the whole division, right? I mean, now we get all these fresh matchups for a title. If Aldo wins, you're going to need to find a really fresh matchup. And, of course, if Edgar wins, that still wouldn't be. And I don't think he gets one even if he wins. But if he loses, you can say, wow, look at this. This is a big moment for him. He beat a guy who, you know, beat everyone but Aldo, all right? I mean, he never fought Max Holloway, but you get the idea. But to your point, yeah, absolutely. He, he I, I don't, I'm not guaranteeing it. It would be a conversation that I think probably would be had. Uh, well, I do agree with you that Bisping is too big for GSP. Don't you think Faraz wouldn't set GSP up to automatically fail? No, of course not. I think they I, I, look. I think Bisping's taking that fight because he and Faraz and his team fundamentally believe that's a winnable contest. They're they're not going in there to lose. I. I 
make no mistake about it, they really believe. But how many times have really smart coaches thought their guy was going to win, and not only did they lose, they got smashed? I mean, this. Do you think Andre Pettineris ever thought Conor McGregor would starch Jose Aldo in 13 seconds? Never. I guarantee you it never crossed his mind that would happen. Win, lose, tough fights, tough rounds, tough moments, sure. But like 13, I mean, it, they're not psychics. Um, all they can do is make educated guesses and develop game plans around it. We don't even know if maybe Faraz even counseled against it and is now, you know, uh, publicly supporting his guy and getting behind him because he you know, believes that's the best chance he has to win. But maybe it might be skeptical of certain things. You guys just never know what people say in public about to what extent it could be true. And I'm not here to call Faraz a liar uh, far from it. I'm just saying, um, let's let's posit your scenario that he fundamentally believes GSP is going to win. And maybe GSP goes in there and does, you know. He's talking about one of the greatest fighters ever. Um, but that confidence could be misplaced. It could be based on an erroneous line of thinking. It could be based on some kind of epic miscalculation. GSP could suffer some kind of injury late and still go through with the fight. Like anything can trip you up. Um, until fight time. So I, I, I am quite confident that they're taking that fight believing that they can win. And if he explained it to me, I'm also quite confident that they would have probably at least some, if not good, very good reasons for thinking that. But that Michael Bisping doesn't inspire fear. He's like a, he's like the championship level Paul Buentello. Like he doesn't inspire fear in guys. And then when people, GSP takes this guy seriously, of course, but when People were surprised by some of the things he can do over and over and over and over again. Uh, Michael Bisping is hard to take down. He is impossible to mentally deter. He has an absolute iron will. It's a five-round fight. He is the bigger guy. He has unyielding cardio, and every round starts on its feet. We're talking about a guy in um, GSP who couldn't sub Matt Hardy. Got close a couple times, you know, and, and Hardy was real rubbery. But, you know... I didn't think Randy Couture was going to beat Tim Sylvia either, so take that for what it's worth. I'm just saying to you that uh, everyone who goes in there at that level believes they're going to win, but that doesn't mean the assumptions based on why are correct. Hey, Luke, please explain how the hell did Nate get bumped down below Michael Johnson and Michael Chiesa? Ooh, did he really? Let's see those. Nate said eight. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't make heads or tails of that stuff sometimes. Do you think that the Arsenal fan TV should do a review of UFC London after the event? Blood fam. No, they should stick to what they know, but they're entertaining at that. Thoughts on Silva versus Gastelum fight? Yeah, I thought you guys want to talk about that earlier. I guess not. Um, Interesting fight, you know. I, of all the people to win the uh, Silva sweepstakes, this one's kind of surprising to an extent. And in some ways, it's not, right? Whitaker's going to fight Jacare. Romero, uh, I mean, I guess he's going to sit or something. I don't know what he's going to do. Um, but Silva wanted to fight on that 212 card. They needed his star power for that, so you know he's going to be on there. He probably wanted another non-Brazilian to compete against. Um, I suspect that the Romero one was not of significant interest, but a smaller guy who's on the rise at 24 years old, who could be a tough contest. That one makes sense. It seems competitive, at least to some degree. I mean, some people are worried that Anderson's going to get run over. I'm I'm less concerned of that, but you never know. Um, it's interesting that like, they didn't give it to Rockhold, who I guess is still coming back from injury or something. But part of the reason why Kelvin got, got it is just a process of elimination. And I guess maybe they're saving Romero for Rockhold. Perhaps that's the case. I, we'll see. But the other reason is that, like, look, um, Kelvin's 24. Walter Wade at some point, maybe, with the right kind of, you know, um, attitude and discipline and nutrition help, presumably, right? But at, at middleweight, he's building his name off of beating guys like Tim Kennedy and now Vitor Belfort and maybe even Anderson Silva. You got a guy at 24, you're transferring star power. Again, this is a game that feeds its elderly to its young. So between the process of elimination about who's there and what their priorities are for matchmaking and needing Anderson Silva at 212 and Kelvin calling him out, which he may have been asked to do, you never know, um, it sort of all fits together, 
right? In kind of a sort of a neat but surprising way, like just thinking in your mind, who would be a great fight for him, for Kelvin Gastelum? To me, it'd be a better fight to fight someone like Robert Whitaker. I was hoping he would face someone who would be a younger contender who um, is also climbing his way through the division and really have those two guys battle it off. But I guess the UFC had other priorities, and he's taken for the Jacare fight for Fox 24, and, and here we are. Oh, I went way too long, didn't I? All right, well, that's that. Um, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, and share it around. I always appreciate it when you do. You can email me at loop.thomas at sbnation.com. And, um, yeah, keep sending me those pictures. If you bought a T-shirt, I always appreciate it when you do. And, uh, yeah, I will be, um, I'll be back next week. All right, until then, thank you guys so much, and uh, stay frosty.